Okay, so today's class, we're going to continue what we began the last couple of weeks talking about, which is the whole question of, uh, well, I have it here as Fourier analysis, it's spectrum analysis, and um, but we're dealing with, with, with how we can try to get this done in an automated form. So just to do a quick recap, and of course, if you have any questions or clarifications from the last time, feel free to let me know if, and also if you're not hearing me for any reason, or if it breaks up, um, let me know, all right? So the recap was that, that we started way back when, even before this course, we started with this thing called the Fourier series. And what you have up there on the top left-hand side is, is of course the exponential, the complex exponential form of the series. And um, in this series, remember it took a periodic signal and um, that's, that's always what you have, have to do here. Um, that, that whatever we're dealing with, XT for the Fourier series must be periodic. All right? So it took the uh, periodic signal and we were able to generate a, um, a series of values from that. And the values happen to be the spectrum of that signal. So the CK values gave us the frequency content of XT. All right. But of course, we could only do this uh, manually because XT is continuous. XT was continuous. And the operation to, to get the values of each component from the DC component up to each harmonic had to be done manually because it's a linear integration. And then we said, OK, let's go from periodic to non-periodic. And the approach that we took was to take the, the period, which was T, and start to make it bigger and bigger. So as the period got bigger, right? We still have the, in theory, the, the, the periodic behavior, except that the period is now huge. And we made some modifications. So if T approached infinity, then you remember omega zero is one over T. So that starts to get very small. And then the spacings in the spectrum start to get closer and closer together. So whereas before we would have each of these CKs giving you an omega naught and then a two omega naught and a three omega naught, instead of these things, the, 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 the spacings got closer and closer together. So instead of a discrete spectrum, we started to have a continuous spectrum. And we made some other little changes along the way. And that led us now to this thing here that we call the Fourier, that we call the continuous time Fourier transform. So again, if I have a continuous signal, non-periodic FT, then I, if I integrate the signal, and notice the e to the minus j omega t, this again comes out from the whole complex um, sinusoid behavior, that we now get a, a spectrum of the signal x omega. And of course, we like this form because this form also looked very close to the Laplace transform that we've been using before. So it's easy to remember. And of course, if you have the, the, the continuous time Fourier transform, which is going from time to frequency, right? Time in some division of seconds of frequency. If you're going that way, for any transform to work mathematically, you must have a way back. So if you have a forward transform, then you must have to have a transform to come back from frequency back into the time domain. Again, this was nice on paper, um, and but it's calculus, it's, it's mechanical stuff. And if, I, if I'm if i given anything in real life to work on, unless I could find the equation Ft for that, then there's no real way I could evaluate that integral at all. So what we said is, okay, we take that now and we make some little um, changes. The first thing that we do, is that we take xt and we sample it. So by taking xt now, we have replaced xt with a series of samples, right? The samples, of course, are supposed to represent what xt looks like, but it's snapshots of it taken at particular times. And if we do that and made certain, um, and, 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 and we, we, we 
we call how we get a sample signal because a sample signal um, involves convolving with, 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 with an impulse train and so on. We could use the properties of impulses and we ended up now moving from the Fourier transform to this thing that we call the discrete time Fourier transform. And because we're dealing with a, a finite series of samples, instead of having a, an infinite sum, which is what an integral is, if you remember from a calculus, an integral is really an infinite sum. What we have is a discrete sum over a particular set of values. In theory, the values could run from minus infinity to infinity. Uh, because if you really want to get a proper representation of xt, then the only way to do that is to take an infinite number of samples of xt. Right, so we 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 kind of making some 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 progress, but at least in this way, we we can. This now is a power series, and we had made a little um, adjustment here, in that we've gone from the continuous time omega to the discrete time capital omega, and remember the relationship is that omega is equal to omega T S, or this is omega over F S or if you want two pi f over fs, right? Where fs is of course a sampling frequency. Keep that particular version in mind because we're going to use it um, in this morning's lecture as well. So you're summing instead of integrating. So we kind of getting a little bit better that we could go at least a forward transform. So we could, if you have a, 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 a sufficient or what, what shall I say, a finite number of samples, then it's possible to do this by hand or even by computer. You could, you could compute some stuff um, and calculate the, 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 the values. But we still have the problem of coming back, right? And in, in like the, the continuous time case, the discrete time Fourier transform to, to, to come back from the time, from the frequency domain back into your time samples requires integration. And once it requires continuous time integration, there's no way to mechanically do that. So we 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 making progress. So what we need to do now is that um, the well, just some comments here. Remember that the 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 transform is periodic. We did that. That the the one that did one of the things about the discrete time Fourier transform is because you were dealing with spectrum replication. We, we spent some time talking about that, that the transform itself here, the spectrum that you get is periodic. So it repeats itself and it repeats itself at the instances of your, um, of your sampling frequency. And this led us also to discuss things like the Nyquist um, sampling theorem. And the Nyquist sampling theorem was such that if you sample at a particular frequency where the original spectrum of X capital omega and the images or the replicants and so on do not overlap. And the minimum frequency for that to happen is that you have to sample at least twice the highest frequency of your signal. All right? So we did all of that last week. So the DTFT results in a continuous frequency spectrum and it requires an infinite sequence in order to work properly. The frequency domain representation, because it's continuous, remember it's still, if you look here, right? It's still, it's a function of this omega, but omega is still related to the continuous time um, frequency um, common omega, right? So it still has that continuous time um, uh, well, what shall I say, um, variable inside of it. So it's still impossible to represent. If I give you a, um, you, you know, some, some, some a, a program to write for this, you still can't do it quite like that. So we have to still make some adjustments. We're making some progress. So there are two things now that we still have to do to make this thing applicable. One is to limit the number of samples to some finite value n. So whereas the DTFT has n going from minus infinity to infinity, what we have to do is to say, okay, we're going to a maximum of n. So we're going from zero to n minus one. 
So this is the first thing. So we take X omega, and now we, we run the transform only from n equal to zero to n minus one. These are my n samples. Okay, so that's step number one. We have to limit the number of samples. And then the other thing now is that we have to make the frequency domain discrete. We have to sample the frequency domain as well because the, the DTFT is still giving us of um, something that depends on a continuous time frequency. So what we do now is that we also divide up the, 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 the um, frequency domain omega into a number of values. And the common practice is to take the same number of values um, or the samples in the frequency domain as they are in the time domain. So if I say I'm using n time samples, I'm also going to use n frequency samples. So that in the frequency domain, the sampling, you remember the frequency domain for the, the, the DTFT is two pi, right? So it's running from zero to two pi radians. We take the two pi radians and we divide it up into N samples. So the, the spacing that we're going to have delta omega is two pi over N, all right? So that the whole frequency span Right, because we're dealing with n samples now, we divide it up into two pi over n, and we're going to look and, and see now the number of these going to go from zero to n minus one, which will cover the whole two span, the, the whole two pi range. Fair enough? Everybody following that? That makes some kind of sense? Yeah? Let me know. Okay. All right, so 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 one person is up. That's fine. So we just did two things. In order to make it work, we have sampled, we reduce the number of samples to a finite amount or a finite number, which is capital N. And then the, the, the output frequency now, we only allow samples of the output frequency. And, we, and that sample has to be, we take the same number N and we divide up the output frequency into that, those little bits of chunks now. So, if you look at it now, what we have is that the, the, the new version of the DTFT is truncated, meaning that it's shortened, right? It is running from n equals zero to n minus one. These are my samples. Omega, remember we had omega here. Omega is now two pi over n, and we have K time K values of those, All right? So that a new version of the DTFT looks like what I have on top here now, All right? So N is going from zero to N minus one and K go also, which is the, 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 the frequency outputs are going from K equals zero to N minus one, yeah? Compare the top and the bottom. So because the output now is a function of K, notice that the outputs here are functions of K now, right? So when K is not, we have something. When K is one, we have something. So we will, the, the output here, instead of using X omega, we have divided up um, omega into chunks that depend on the value K. So we're going to call this X K now. We have this, and this is now the, 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 the version. So we replaced omega by this, by a, a series of bits that, that, that we're going to, um, to, to, to increment in values of k. And the output now is a function of k. This is something that is now known as a discrete Fourier transform of xn, as, a, as opposed to the original one, which was the discrete time Fourier transform, Fourier transform, right? So notice what we have here. For each value of K, I can compute and K, remember K is my um, frequency output, the, the, the bin values two pi over N multiplied by K. So for each value of K, I can compute an output 
And then I have to go through all the values of K and all the values of N. And this equation now transforms samples of the time domain into samples of the frequency domain. Everybody seeing what we're doing? We started with the, 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 the discrete time Fourier transform, which was trans, where, where, which converted or transformed samples of the time into a continuous mapping in the frequency domain. We can't do that um, automatically. So what we've said is, okay, we're going to make some modifications. And what we have now is something that is going to transform samples of time into samples of frequency. So already you can see some, some we, we, we're going to have some things to contend with here because we saw sampling in time creates one set of issues. If I have, I'm going to try to, to, to transform samples of time into samples of frequency. And these frequencies only exist at k equal to zero, k equal to one and two. So you already see that if my, my whatever I do doesn't translate into something that is going to meet one of those samples of frequencies, then I'm going to have a little problem and we're going to encounter that in a second. But everybody all right? Any questions on, on, on what I'm doing? Make sure you understand, all right? And of course now, because we're going from samples in one direction to samples in the other, then the inverse transform is simply taking is the same forward transform. And what you do, you swap the forward transform had xn inside and xk outside. The transform to go from time to frequency had a negative sign. So to go back from frequency to time, we have a positive sign here. And remember, when we are doing our calculations, we have see, we've seen that every time we do the sampling, we have to divide by a value of n to scale the timing properly. This could be done either in the forward transform or the, or the reverse, but here is where it is to properly account for that. You see, remember when we took five samples of the unit step that the amplitude was five, when we took nine, the, 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 the DC amplitude was nine and so on. Right, and we had this. We say we would divide by the number of samples. So here it is again. Right, it can either be in the forward transform going from time to frequency, or it can be in the reverse transform going from frequency back to time. But this is how we account for that. Yeah. So this equation now transforms samples of the frequency domain into samples of the time domain. Okay. So we now have something. And if you put the two of them here, it is now um, the, the forward transform and the inverse transform. This is now something that is that you could program. Notice this is like two, like a nested loop. So you have an inner loop. So if I take, if I have, and we'll, we'll, we'll see the calculations in a second. So if I have five samples, right? If I have five samples, then I'm summing from naught to four. So inside of here, Right, n is going from naught to four, k will go from naught to four. So inside of here, what you do is that for k equal to naught, you do the entire inner loop. Then k equal to one, you do the inner loop, k equal to two, and so you keep going until you finish it off. So this is just two nested loops, which is something that you all are accustomed to doing in programming. Same thing for the, 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 the transform coming back. Right, so we now have something that can take um, that can take samples of what I have and give me an idea of what the frequency content is. The frequency content is going to be samples of, 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 of what is really there, but again, we can work with that. It's better than nothing, yeah? So let's see. This is applicable because we have both um, discrete and finite sequences to deal with. Okay, now in what we do here, and we'll see, we have this, this bit here to deal with, and we'll come to that in a second, right? This is, remember, we started off with J omega n, 
and now omega is really two pi over n, okay? And, but we have k values of, of that. So that is what omega is, and we have the n on the outside still. What they do in, in signal processing is that they e to the j two pi over n bit. So this bit here, e to the j, you take all this, so e, we have minus j, we have two pi over n, right? And we have kn here. e to the j, the minus j two pi over n, we give it a symbol called W, capital WN, right? And this is standard all over signal processing. So that if you use W N now, there's a little, there's a shorthand way now, a, a little shorter way of writing it. So the DFT pair is now XN, WN, WN is e to the minus J two pi over N, and you multiply in this by K and N. Right? So it's exactly the same thing, but I've replaced it by this symbol instead of having to write e to the minus j two pi over capital N all the time. And don't ask me why, but in the, in the signal processing world, they call that W thing a twiddle factor, right? That is in all the books. So every book you will see, they have this funny thing, somebody, I, I don't know what they were smoking in, in the 1960s when they came up with this thing, right? But the first time they, 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 they came across this thing, somebody decided to call this the twiddle factor and it stuck. So every book you would ever read, when they talk about twiddle factors, this is what they're talking about, all right? So WN, the twiddle factor inside of here. So the shorthand that we have is that the forward pair is XN, WN, K, W, subscript capital N to the power um, lowercase n and k. And the inverse transform, of course, is exactly the same form. You interchange x and um, 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 x of k and xn, and you reverse the sign so that you go the other way around. Okay? So in terms of um, an operation, this is what happens, therefore. For each value of k, remember k, is the frequency um, samples. Each K, so you pick a value of K and then you evaluate all of the outputs um, for that value of K from N equal to zero to N minus one. And then you add it up. And then you increment k. So for k equal to zero, you would have w um, um, zero zero to w zero n minus one, and you evaluate all of that. Then k equal to one, you would have w um, well one by zero, which is still zero, to w n minus one. K equal to two, you would etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, until all of the samples, the n minus one, you go from zero to n minus one. All right. Okay, so if you're following that, you remember we said last week and, and briefly this morning that the DTFT was periodic and anybody remember what the period was? We may be, it was because of how it fun, in function, it was periodic, no, not infinity, not infinity. That we we made the, 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 the we we said that this the, the, the signal x was period was periodic with a period of infinity, but the DTFT itself, the output, the x capital omega, had a period of. You remember spectrum replication, right? When you do the DTFT, if this was my original signal here. After the DTFT, I used I am getting the spectrum and it is repeating itself every two pi radians. Remember, so the DTFT is periodic with a period of two pi radians. All right, and that is not thing or 
or if you like, or because remember omega is omega ts, right? Then this is really repeating itself every fs, right? Or fs hertz. Yeah. What about the DFT now? What would be the period of the DFT? Right. Think a little bit. What we've done, we took this, which is periodic with a period of 2 pi or Fs hertz, 2 pi radians or Fs hertz, and we have divided this up into n bits. Right. So we have taken the, the, the the thing and we've divided it up, we divided it up into n. So if we have divided it up into n, what is the period of the DFT now? Instead of two pi, we have said we only dealing with n samples, right? So if the DTFT, if we've done that, then by our action, we have made the DFT period become n because we have imposed that. Remember, we're saying that we are trying, we are taking the samples in time and we are mapping it to a set of n frequencies. We've divided up the two pi into n frequencies. So what we're saying is that after n frequencies, um, the, the, the thing will repeat itself again. Yeah? Yeah? Or what we did is that we have taken Fs and we have it Fs over n, if you like. That was the assumption that we've made. Just like we, we took two pi and divided it up into n bits, same thing, or we have divided up the output into bits and pieces of Fs. So the spectrum will repeat itself after n frequency samples. And the output frequencies are given by multiples of Fs over N. Make sense? Yeah? Right. So now this is something that we call the bin frequencies. If you think of like having a set of buckets or bins, right? That's not, excuse me a second. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, okay, so right, so so if you, if you imagine this thing as working like like we have a series of buckets, and and you have the samples coming in, the x ends coming in, it goes into the, the 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 discrete Fourier transform now, and it is going to 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 separate the frequency components, but the only frequency components that you have have to line up with each of those buckets or bins. All right, that is how it works. So if there's a frequency component that doesn't line up with the, with, 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 with the, the, the bin that you have or the bucket, it's not going to drop into that. It's only the ones that line up with those will drop in. Everything else is going to get missed, right? So that is the, the compromise that we're dealing with here. We are, we, we've taken samples in time and we're going to try to match it with samples and frequencies. If we are careful, 
with our sampling frequency, with, with, with our sampling frequency Fs here. All right, if I'm careful with Fs and the number of samples, then hopefully they, they, this, when, when I do my DFT on some signal, a component is going to land up in one of the bins and I'm going to detect it, All right? That's how it works. So again, let, let's see, let, let, let's make sure everything makes sense. The maximum bin frequency will between will, will occur if I am, remember, if I, if I have my spectrums here and I'm replicating it, right? Then the, the maximum frequency that I have is when K is equal to N over two. Remember, I'm saying that the thing is periodic with N, but because of the Nyquist frequency and so on, the maximum frequency has to be halfway in, into there. Otherwise I will have aliasing and the like. And you could prove it and if you say, okay, so F max is when N over two and I have Fs over N bins. So that means that my maximum frequency is at Fs over two, which is Nyquist, right? Or if I want that Fs has to be twice my maximum frequency. So I'm consistent, right? You have to make sure that whatever you're doing is make, making sense, right? So here it is graphically. In the time domain, I have N samples, X zero to X N minus one that I've taken every T S intervals apart. And what I've done is now I'm translating that from time when I apply the DFT, it is going to convert that into N frequency samples, right? So it is going to try to map this into these frequency samples here. Zero, Fs over one, Fs over two, Fs up to, sorry, sorry, Fs over one, Fs over two, Fs up to N over two, right? Which is here, there, um, Sorry, my mistake. Fs over n, two Fs over n, n is, n is whatever is the number of samples, not Fs over two. So it's mapping it zero, Fs over n, two Fs over n, all the way up, up, up to, to, to when I reach the, the Nyquist frequency. And then I have the other values on, on, on top there, which I could ignore. All right, everybody getting that? You with me? All right, grab my attention, say something if it's not making sense, all right? Right, so let's go back to this um, thing that we had. Last week, Wednesday, we took, we, we, we took a square, uh, a, a rectangular pulse, right? It's running from minus 4.4 to plus 0.4 seconds. We sampled it at, at intervals of 0.2 seconds, and we calculated the, the, the DTFT and we saw the sort of sync function shape. So I'm going to do that now with the DFT. And let's see, you could get an idea of how the mechanisms, the, the actual operations of, of the, um, the, the process will work. Let's apply the DFT. So if TS is 0.2, FS is one over 0.2, which is five hertz. So the bin frequencies, remember, how many samples do I have? N is what? Capital N is what? Here. N equal to, how many samples do I have? Five, right? So N is five. So that FS, my bin spacing is five over N. Okay, N is five, so my bin spacing is one. So what is the frequencies that I have? If my sampling frequency is this, the Nyquist frequency is five over two, which is 2.5 Hertz. According to, to, to my spacings, I am dividing this up into intervals of one Hertz, so I have zero, I have one, I have two, 
The next one I have is three. But if my Nyquist frequency is 2.5, then this is where the replication starts to take place. So everything above two, I could ignore. So the bin frequencies for this would be simply zero, one, and two. Make sense? Yeah? Right, so Xn is now these values, one, 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 five ones, of course, so that they, they, they um, DFT output XK, I have to sum from zero to N minus one, Xn, Wn, K minus one, and remember Wn is E to the minus J two pi over N. Right, so that's W and and I have to do that K and N. So how many? So if I expand it, for instance, X zero, which is the first value when K is zero, will be X zero W five zero zero plus X one W five zero one plus X two. W502 plus X3, W503, and so on, up to the last one, which is X5, W504. And that is the first output value here. That is for K equal to zero. Then for K equal to one, I'm going to have to do the same thing. X1 will be equal to now X0, W5, K is, uh, one, n is zero, so it's, it's one zero, all the way up here to x five w five one four. Well, one multiplied by four, and is it is this is zero by zero, it is zero by one, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then I have to do x two, x three, x four, etc. So we have to calculate all those twiddle factors, right? How many of them? How many twiddle factors I have to calculate? K going from zero to four, N going from zero to four. So how many values in, in all I have to do? No, not four by four. You have to count zero. You're going from zero to four, which is Five by five, which is 25. Right, for each value of K, you have to calculate five for five values of N. So you have five values of N and you have five values of K. So you have to calculate 25 values of W, right? So if you like, I've put it in a matrix. And the N, remember this is, we are evaluating E to the minus J two pi over five, right? By K N, K going from zero to four, N going from zero to four. All right, so if you tabulate it in a table, the N's going across, that's my pointer, right? The ends going across the top here. Right. The ends going across the top here. The K is going down here. So you could fill in the 25 values inside of here. All right? So if you do that, notice it's not particularly easy yet. All right? You have these things to call it, but it's something that could be done. You could program to do that. All right? So if you complete the exercise, you get that X0. When you work out these things, it's five, x1 is zero, x2 is zero, x3, x4, x5, right? Now, notice that is really only, this is, this is DC. This is um, the first one, the bin, the, the, the first bin, which is one hertz. This is the second bin, which is two hertz. This will be the third bin, which is three, which is past, remember Nyquist is 2.5. So everything above here is above Nyquist, so we, we ignore that. That, is, that, that 
those will be the, the, the replicants being created here. Right, so zero, one, and two. So if I look at it and you plot it out, this is what the, the spectrum looks like. The one on the left, this is all it can detect. The one on the right is the continuous time, sorry, the discrete time Fourier transform. If we ignore the negative frequency, so let, let, let's just right, kind of ignore that. Notice that the DFT, sorry, the DTFT, we had a DC value here, right? It was saying a zero here, a zero here, but we, because it's continuous, we were seeing it's able to pick up components between these points here. And of course, Nyquist is right here, right? Notice what the DFT is doing. It can only detect the bin frequencies. That's the first thing that you have to realize. This can only detect bin frequencies. The bins are DC. We're picking up the five here, which is the same as we have here. The next bin is one. It's correct. That was nothing. The next bin after that is two. We correct. It's nothing. After that, you could ignore because it, this is the Nyquist point here, 2.5, right? So the DFT is only showing me and is only able for this particular example to resolve the DC component here. Everybody seeing that? Mm -hmm. And this is because we've taken this, which was a continuous um, spectrum in omega, we've taken this and we've divided it up into n bits called the bins. So it either you match the bin or you do, or you don't. In the case of the DFT, you have the, these three bins, zero, one, and two. The only thing that has a value in it that is lining up is the zero or the DC, right? I've put the two of them. So you see what the DTFT envelope looks like or what the DTFT, oh, sorry, what the DFT is actually producing. It's correct, but it's not particularly helpful yet, all right? But it can be done mechanically. So in, in terms of the comments, the DFT is approximating the, 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 the discrete time Fourier transform because we are sampling frequency now. Insufficient samples and bin output makes for a poor approximation. Remember, our bins are Fs over N. We only have five samples in this case for N. So our resolution is very poor, it's Fs over five which is one hoops, right? So clearly the more samples you have, the better this thing will work. So about an eight sample. If I take eight samples now, then let's see how, what that will do in terms of the computations. The computations now, eight samples of time to map eight samples in the frequency domain. So N, K is going to run zero to seven. That's right, let me ease that a bit. All right. K is going zero to seven, right? N is going zero to seven. So in terms of the twiddle factors, this is eight, this is eight, total of eight. So we have to calculate a total of 64 twiddle factors in this case. Right? So you're going all the way from zero, zero, all the way up to the last one, which will be X7, which will be W877. A total of 64 twiddle factors. Now, if you look at it, each row, each row has eight of these. 
right? Each row has eight of these. And inside of here, we have, sorry, for each of these, we have eight of these. So we have eight complex multiplications. And if I have eight things to add, I have seven plus seven complex additions. Per row. Right, so eight multiplications and seven additions for each row that I have to deal with. So in general now, if I have any endpoint, now eight is a very small number, right, of samples. Normally you're, you're dealing with samples in the hundreds or the thousands. So if I dealing with, let's say, instead to make the thing useful for some applications, n is a thousand. Then to calculate the DFT, I'm going to have to do a million multiplications, right? Which is 10 to the power six multiplications. And in this case, a thousand by, well, you have a thousand by N minus one, 999 addition. So almost a thousand multiplications and a thousand, uh, sorry, a million multiplications and a million additions. Right. In terms of a practical application, if you were to do this now and you want to evaluate something in real time, so let's say you have some sound coming in or some signal coming in and you need to check the frequency content of it in real time. If you have a thousand samples, or as I have here, 1024, which is a power of two, and, and you'll see why we do that um, by, uh, on Wednesday. I need approximately a million multiplications and a million additions. And these are complex multiplications, it's complex numbers you're dealing with, right? So this is something that is going to take time. And clearly, um, all it could be done mechanically is not something that is easy to do in real time. It's going to take too long, right? So we're going to see that we, 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 we should be able to do something about it. As a start, if you look at the, the, the um, twiddle factors here from the last example, you see anything as yet if you just watch the table? You're seeing anything looking, um, looking useful in this chart? What about it? Right, some of the factors repeat and then some of the factors, um, right, somebody's saying that there are only really four numbers inside of here, if you look at it carefully. And what we're dealing with is like, if you look at this one here, if you look at this one, and you look at this one for argument's sake, it's the same twiddle factor except the sign has been changed. And then this one, and this one is the same, right? This one and this one, the sign has been changed, okay? This one and this one, the sign has been changed. So in other words, this is a conjugate of that one. So you see there are patterns here, but this is, this is where we have um, 25 values, which is, not a, which is not a useful number. Let's see what happens if N is even. Here are the twiddle factors are picked an even to number 16, right? So I'm computing N equal for 16. So K going from zero to 15 and um, N is also going from zero to 15. So if you evaluate the, the, the twiddle factors here, if you look at something here, right at the halfway mark, notice that everything, you calculate zero to seven, here, which are these, the, the, the first set of values here. Notice after that, this value is minus the first one, minus one. This value is minus this. This value is minus this. This value is minus this. So there's a, there's a pattern here where if the number is even, 
once you reach the halfway stage, everything past the halfway stage is minus the, the, the values of the first bit. In other words, this, this little arrangement here. Right? So that W, um, this is what we call the symmetry property. So once you go past um, half, then the, the second half is just simply minus the first half. And then once we exceed N, once we go past N, this is 15. If I go to W 16, 16 here now, that goes all the way back up to the first one, W zero, which is on top here. It's past my, I have a little menu on top here that is affecting me, right? So that's a periodicity, periodicity property. So because of that, we really only have to calculate, if I, if I have an even number, I really only have to calculate half of the values, right? So that behavior, right, um, simplifies quickly, provided n is, is even now that I have a, a simple, um, first off, um, I only have to calculate half of the values. And then secondly, if you watch here, you will notice that at this point in time, this and this, all I've changed is the sign on the real part. So in fact, like somebody was pointing out before, in, I have 16 values inside of here, but there's only four numbers that are really moving around inside of here. So if I calculate those four, then from the first four, I could get the next four, which gives me the first eight. And then the second eight is the, 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 the minus the first eight and so on, all right? So already we're seeing that there are some properties here that we could make use of. I'll stop here. Tomorrow's class, we will talk about that and then we will move on to see how we can use that to make this thing work even more efficiently. Okay? Everybody following what we did? All right, so go back over it again. Um, just bear um, in and recap what we did is that we started off with the DTFT, which took samples, but gave us a continuous spectrum. It can't work. So what we do is that we take the spectrum and take samples of the spectrum. We divide up the set spectrum into the same number of samples that we had in time. And by doing that now, we come up with a transform called the discrete Fourier transform that can map samples of time to samples of frequency. The samples of frequency we call the bin values. And unfortunately, if your, your frequency is coming in, doesn't match any of the, the, the bin values, you're not going to pick it up. And we saw that with a simple example. And then after that, we saw that the DFT, unfortunately, requires a certain number of complex multiplications and complex additions. But when we look carefully at it, we realize that the, the values of the twiddle factors repeat. And in some, and they not only repeat, but all, all, all you have in some of them is a sign change. And what we saw, the last thing that we saw is that if you make the number of samples even, that we can exploit that repeating, um, the, 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 the repetition of the values to an even greater extent. Tomorrow we're going to look at that and complete this bit and then see how we can use that going forward to, 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 to lead to something that is even more efficient than this, something called a fast Fourier transform, all right? Okay, so everybody, any, any questions on, on, on this? All right. Okay, and of course, as you, as you think about it, when we meet next, not, not tomorrow, sorry, when we meet on, on Wednesday morning, um, bring your questions. If you have a chance to look, look, look over this or the observations that you made, All right? Bring it and we will take it from, from that point. Okay, so I'm going to...